Welcome to Artflix on CBA TV. My name is Muti Olawi, the host and producer of this show, and the only show in the entire Africa, no doubt about that anyway, uh, where we explore the world beyond even Africa through the literary binocular of writers, creative writers all over the world. And again today, we are going back to Liberia, and we are using the literary binocular of Patricia Wesley Javi, the professor of creative writing at Penn State University in Pennsylvania in the United States. So I wouldn't want to say much. We want to use our work. We want to go deeply into our work today. Meet me on the other side and there we we'll look at what she has for us in detail. See you there. Thank you for joining us once again. Um, uh, without much ado, we we'll have to go deeply into uh, the exploration of the world of uh, this writer, and that is uh, Patricia Wesley Jabi. So let's go into the second part of this. Um, uh, this time we're exploring, we're going deeply into the entire world of this writer through her writing. So let's move into the content. Um, uh, Patricia, would you like to explain to us, you've written a lot of work, yes, um, and I've explored a lot of them. I've checked almost everything, and um, there are some that I feel it would not be ideal if we don't uh, thoroughly go deeply into them. Um, but I would want our viewers to have a taste of your writing from the time you started having holistic publication as an expert in the area of uh, creative writing. Um, let's talk about 2003. Uh, that should be like, uh, how many years ago? That should be like 17 years ago. You wrote a book titled Becoming Ebony. What inspired you to write that book? And what is the book all about? The book was being written and um, most of the points in that book were written that um, that's my second book they were written during my the doctoral program i entered the phd program in 98 and so most of the poems in that book were written during those years prior to 98 but a lot of the poems were written as a student in the phd program but I already had a previous publication, and, and so I, it was inspired mostly, like a lot of the first books, and by me being an, an unwilling immigrant in America. I had lived in America. I got my master's from Indiana University. My husband and I study at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana from 1983 to 85. And we went home the very week we finished exams. We didn't even wait for our papers. And we, we were graduated from distance, okay, long distance. <laughs> so we went back home to teach at the University of Liberia. And so I was not new to America, but this time we had come as immigrant and not international students. And so most of those poems were written by that time and about that, that they were inspired by the anger. The, the book was published in 2003. It won the Crab Orchard Award in 2002. But that was my dissertation. That became my dissertation because I did a PhD program that I am a very unique program, only a few of them are in the United States, and it's a program that it is an English PhD, but um, you are a creative writing student. Very tricky. So you are actually literally doing two PhDs. So you have to pass all of the English exams. You take the exam with all the English PhDs. You take the PhD exam, you, you pass, you have to pass, I think, seven areas of literature all of the literature of America, half of the literature of England, and then you had to pass the poetry section from beginning to contemporary. 
So it's a real weird degree. I think they should give us two PhDs because we're, we're taking we're taking an exam with the literature specialist and they and we, but we had a creative dissertation, but they were not happy. So we did also that we did another we had to do a one of one hundred to two hundred page and uh, paper on and um, a scholarly dissertation. So we had like two dissertations. My 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 dissertation my prose dis dissertation was was the exploration of um. Uh, African literature's influence on Black American literature, focusing on Lucille Clifton and Okok Petit, the two of them, and how connected they are and how African literature has influenced African American literature. And, but they, they said the one that was the main dissertation was Becoming Ebony. In the middle of writing that book, my mother died in 2000. So the book became reshaped. So I began to write a lot about my mother. So the title poem, Becoming Ebony, was written about a day or two after she died. And so the, most of the book changed focus during the grieving period. So between 2000 and 2002, when I had the dissertation write, ready, the book had changed. The whole idea of becoming ebony um, comes from the African image of the ebony tree, that pain of losing my mother. So, um, and the whole idea of how we become strong with suffering and how we take our proper place when we lose the pillar that we're depending on, then we become Ebony. It's the process of becoming when the when the wood is carved and shaped, and and the forming and becomes iron, almost like iron when you touch the ebony. It's after years of suffering. So that's that's what inspired that book. Yeah. Uh, four years later, uh, you wrote another book, uh, which was uh, titled "River." The river is rising. What what river? What kind of river is rising? Um, uh, are you talking about the physical river or uh, the literary or metaphorical rivers? What led to this? And uh, can you give us a little bit about this? Okay. So I grew up with the Mesorado River behind me. From the time I was six or five years old, what I was living with my mother, because my mother, I had, my father took custody of me when I was 13. So behind my father's house was the river, was the Mesorado. And then I grew up, and, and, and then when I was in college, we moved further away uh, from the, cap, the city, where we're on Capitol Hill, actually. Behind the house was a river. In fact, we were so close to the river. Sometimes when I came home from school, I would go to the river to, to fish, and then catch fish and cook soup. <laughs> that, that was a, a work, work, work. We'll go sit by the river and catch crabs, you know, just, you know, put a hook with a rice grain. And, whatever. and then, so we grew up on the river. But then there was the ocean to which people were swimming in and being killed. You could walk to the ocean. If, if you drive from one end of the river to another, you will see the ocean. So, so that river that is rising, and, and where I have my own house in the suburb in Congo Town, there's a massive river behind my house right now. It's a massive land and then a swamp and then a river. Yesterday I was trying to track my son who was, you know, the, we have these devices where this, the family, my children try to keep track of me, but I keep track of them too. So I go on it and I see my entire neighborhood and I see the swamp and the river and then behind us. So it is from that idea of the river swelling. So the river rises to, um, for a whole lot of reasons. In that year, I wrote that poem, but also that we had a first woman president. But then it was not like my choice, but I was celebrating the end of the war because we had lost hundreds of thousands of people. And I felt this overwhelming. 
and they were talking about me being a river that was rising. That's not about me. It's about the poem is is a uh, is the river is rising. It's song for Liberian women, and so it was talking about how women were now rising. And yeah, so there's so many women's names in the poem, including Ellen Johnson Salif's name is in the poem. Mm. So and um, that's where that title came from. And but most of the titles are historically around Liberia's recovery. Oh, that, that's really interesting. So it symbolizes the liberation of the Liberians after the Civil War. And also it has um, a connotative um, uh, relevance or reference to what we call feministic world, as you refer to um, uh, Helen Joseph Salif taking over as a woman after the Civil War. That's interesting. Let's go into another one that you published, which was uh, titled, Where the Road Turned. Which road turned? Is it the Civil War road? Is it um, the political or cultural? What kind of road are you referring to in this uh, book titled, Where the Road Turned? It's, it's the road, where the political road, the Liberian road, the road out of the war into the free into as post war, it had turned, but it had turned the wrong way. So people were still starving, people were still struggling, and every and they say the war is over, but the war was not really over. So this was and the joining was getting you know crooked. And, and, and these also are inspired by experiences we had. You know, 14 years of war, the war ends, and then the road turns, and then the war begins, and then the war ends and the war begins for 14 years. Even the day I was, we were released from the displaced sent refugee camp, was for this refugee camp for internally displaced refugees of Liberia, we were going home, there were stray bullets that were killing people in line with us, being led by the peacekeepers to get back to, out of the, you know, they were liberating the city, town, the country, city by city, town by town. So, and um, so this is all of that idea of the road turning back, the road that we're on, how we used to feed roads by waiting, food will come tomorrow or something like that. So then that goes, then, then the, the, last, the other title, When the Wanderers Come Home. Yeah, I was just about to ask you uh, 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 this uh, book titled, When the Wanderer Come Home. Who were the wanderers? <laughs> were you part of them? Or uh, what really, what kind of meaning are you trying to encode to your reader when you say, where the one, I mean, When the Wanderers Come Home? Yeah, we are the wanderers. We go home. We go home to discover what the termites, that termites have taken over, not only our lives, but everything. And so, and then the termites are the politicians and those who have been eating away all that, that we have. And we've discovered that why, what we went to war for was for nothing. And so when the wanderers come home, the wanderers do not fit in. Now, and I wrote it during my last sabbatical year. And um, that's about it with the last sabbatical. I have one coming up in the in the fall, but that was 2013 when I was in Liberia. And I had two, I had a project to finish my memoir, and I'm still looking for a publisher. I'm, I'm not I should, I will be actively looking again soon. And, and then I've finished the memoir, edited it down, polished it, but then I accidentally wrote this book. So when I came back from sabbatical and that year, my, my 2000, my fall was here and my spring was in Africa. And because that's what the weapon says, it's a, you win an award. And you know, this is my second time winning the humanities fellowship, which is gave you a whole semester off, you know. So, and I came home and then Kwame Dawes sent me an email 
asking me for a book. And I'm like, I don't have a book. What are you asking me for a book? I have a memoir. He said, I don't want a memoir. I want a book of poem. I said, no. He's, he kept bothering me. So I said, okay, I will say the poems I have. And then I sent him and he said, well, you have a book. Are you, something's wrong with you? You wrote a book over three, four months. And then I put them together and it was a book. <laughs> so, and the whole idea of the wandering, you know, the African proverb, we have it in Grable. And so the wandering child does not know her mother's grave. You come home and you can't identify where the grave is because you've been away too long. So it comes on our idea. We are wanderers. We come home. They call us American. <laughs> and then we find out they are different people. They are not the same people. I think I sent you a poem that say, I stand here. Mm. I stand I, um, I stand here, you know, or something like that. So I stand here. Yeah. So is that other poem that is also in our book where you are wondering, you can't fit in. You want to cross all the treasure and enter your father's house, but you don't fit in because the people there now have become a new people. They are different. They are not the people that went to war and they are they are not even the people that survived the war. They are new people. And, 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 and then that book also has poems like what took us to war, you know, is, is, make it, is uh, making its ugly head up uh, known again or something like that. So I was beginning, I saw a lot of stuff that the country, uh, so I was writing Liberia's history. That's why I'm telling you that um, even though we don't have a good history book. And uh, some of us, uh, I learned American history first from American literature. I learned French history about the French Revolution from French literature. I learned the British history from British literature. Yeah, uh, wondrous indeed. Because if you have um, left your domicile or your place for a long time and you come back, Technically, you find it difficult to get used to the system. Um, you'll be wandering around and try to get yourself acquainted to the setting. Uh, anyway, I've got a lot to discuss, but there's something I actually want us to um, go deeply into. That is your latest uh, publication. Uh, but we need to go for a break. When we come back, then we can explore extensively. Out there. Tune in to CBA TV, the voice of East Africa and beyond. Uh, There's so many people around the world who are watching along with you. Welcome back to uh, the second part of this very important show. We're in Liberia today. We have been to different parts of the globe. And this is the first time we will be in Africa. And this is the episode two. We're looking at the world of Liberians through Patricia Wesley Jabi. And um, we have explored extensively some of our work that she had written in the past. Uh, but this time around, we will be going into our latest work. Uh, it has a lot that if we go deeply or extensively into it, we will have enough opportunity to extensively uh, understand what Liberians have faced in the past, what they are facing right now. And perhaps, if possible, we might end up even understanding what might push the Liberia to a better stand in future. Um, we are back. Uh, I want us to focus extensively on... Um, Prayer song for my children. But before that, I need you to go into one of the poems in the, in the book. And uh, as this will serve as interlude for us, when we come back, well, then we'll see what we can do to actually thoroughly 
uh, deal with uh, this very important book, especially this time of uh, trials, global trials that everyone is facing. And uh, what is this poem all about? It is titled November 12, 2015 for Liberia. So please render these lines for our viewers to enjoy and perhaps if you have the time, explore it with them later. November 12, 2015, for Liberia. November 12, 30 years after our failed coup, and I am driving through another city. Hills, valleys, old houses clinging to years gone. I've been an alien so long, sometimes I feel like we belonging. But the ground here is gray, soft clay, rocks in between white soil, clay enough to turn soil into pots and plates into jugs. Differences measure not only in the cold November frost, the falling leaves, or in the slow yellowing of oak. Even though we know that no matter how long it takes the oak to yellow and turn red like fire, red like blood, no matter how stubborn its will, the oak will share its leaves like all the other trees become as brittle as dry limbs after a forest fire. November 12, and my mind takes me way back home, home, the humid sun bright, hot like fire, and the town divided by the ocean and the river, the past of bloodshed, the burning anger and pain, when years ago a hero came, or shall we call him coward? Famous Kuyungba, cool planner, or shall we call him the messenger of death sent by alien people to rob us of home. Liberia, fire, death, the massacre of our people, the beginning of the rest of our lives in exile. November 12th, as I drive through this strange town, where for years my heart has longed for home, the early morning mist rising out of the mess of rattle, the honking cars, the market women on their way to work, and out of nowhere, my neighbor's voices shouting at another hard day. November 12, but this is where the road leads home, the earth red, blood and water, my family line, where the soil still holds onto my umbilical cord, buried in the hills of Dolokan, home and Morovia, where my father's grave awaits my return. As I kneel and cry and pray and tell him how sometimes I am so lonely in this far away country. I want to walk and walk and walk and walk and walk until I'm back home again. November 12, no matter how ugly they say home looks, there's never a day when you do not want to go back home. Welcome back. I guess you've enjoyed this very short but um, pathetically structured poem written by Patricia Wesley Jabe. Um, you've got to understand, even without telling you the pains, the experience these people face um, during the war and even after the war. Uh, let's go into the exploration of the book itself, the latest publication you've heard, which is Prayer Song 
for my children. What led to the change in the titling of the book? You have been using different um, titles before. You have talked about when the wanderer comes like that. But now, you now switch to uh, like a mother talking about children. But before you were talking like a lonely woman, uh, a lonely lady uh, who is struggling to survive in the world. But now you've seen yourself as a mother uh, who is concerned about her children. Why did you change or you switch from the general titling to motherhood titling system? Prayer song for my children. When you're writing, you don't, when you're writing poetry, you don't set out and say, this is what's going to be my theme. You never set out to do it. And then you write, you know, and then it happens that it becomes something people say, okay, this is, this is what she's doing. Well, this section, that new section, the prayer song section that is the new poems are different. They are like the first book. And um, before the palm could bloom, poems of Africa mm -hmm. is very influenced by the Africans. They are not even influenced by America yet. Because I started writing those poems, some of them before the war. And so they've got many traditional poems. In our first section, I have a poem called Tubak and my home village about the warriors coming out. That experience of going back to Maryland County, my tradition, yes, in the United States, plus more years in Moravia, I was, so my poetry is a little different in that section. Um, so that's a section in which I'm paying tribute to my father in Fire and Rain. And, and I have a poem called At the Border. And so, of course, I'm talking about border, bordering tribes you know, as the land evolves. And I'm talking about the depletion of forest lands. And I'm talking about traditional things again. So and I think every writer should go back to where they came from, their home, and be inspired. Even if they grew up in a city to go home to their village, no matter how far away, because that that will influence, that will impact the poetry. When I went there, I didn't go there to learn how to write the way I'm supposed to write again. I didn't go there to change my way of writing. I just went to see my homeland again. And, and I've been going back. I've gone back three or four times since then. And so that has helped redirect my poetry back to my roots, which is necessary. That's interesting to know. Um, uh, without much ado, I want us to briefly go through this uh, book. Uh, one of the most striking uh, poems that really captured my mind and made me to enter the character. You, your writing generally is simple, so it makes me to really understand, or I can say it makes it easy for your audience or your readers to decode your message without troubling themselves. So um, um, there's one striking poem I need you to um, elaborate. I've looked at it and um, the poem is titled Fire and Rain. But before that, um, well, what, what I could deduce from that uh, is uh, you were trying to dodge communication with your father. What happened at that time? I know it's a real story. Give us uh, a little bit about this poem, Fire and Rain. Who is the fire? Who is the rain? Are you the fire or your dad? Or who is who in this poem? Yeah, the poem is called Fire and Rain. Yes. <laughs> my, father, my father was a tough father, you know, very loving. So his rain, but he's also fire. So he would scream and then he would pour rain over the fire. You know, that's why I look at him. Very tough. He was tough like steel. And, and he was the kind of person that you would come home from studying abroad, very pregnant, and you go to his office and he's behind his big desk and you are proud and you expect him to lift you up 
and say, congratulations, my daughter. But he says to you, okay, you're doing well, you're having babies, and you got to bring up, put that baby down and get back, turn around and get back to the United States for your, for your dad trip. And that's the kind of person he was, you know, very push, pushing you to excel. And, and because all your life, I am the star in my family. You know, so my father is depending on me to bury him. He was the one who was like, this is my daughter. She's going to give me the biggest burial, you know. And so I knew he was ill. And I was supposed to be in Liberia on May 16, 2014. I had a ticket. I had fellowship. I, had, I knew what I was going to be doing. Just like now, my trip is canceled and my father was dying. I remember my brother and my son and my my brothers and my son and everybody saying they wanted to bring my father to to see me on skype because he was crying he wanted to see me you call me in the morning seven o'clock and he had a sharp voice you will never know you never know he was dying because he was still alert he was arguing about politics and corruption and and reminding me to stay true to my traditions so he was that kind of person. You so I didn't know he was that skinny, like a skeleton. So they wanted me to meet him on Skype. And then my other brother said, Let me warn you, he looks like a skeleton. Do you want to see that person? He's anxious to see you. And I said, No. I don't want to remember my father like that. I will talk to him every day, but I will not see him in that skeleton state. You know, one morning he said, explain this to me. You who used to come to Liberia just to go in the bathroom. <laughs> you cannot come to see me before I die. You used to come just to change your clothes. You came to Liberia. <laughs> That's how you put it. <laughs> and, and, and I could not tell him that I had cancer. I could not. And because he would have died immediately. So my father called me. And that was the tough one. My father said, you were supposed to be here today. And what did you do? You sent the things by someone. Now I know you are not coming. Let's talk about why you're not coming. And when you come, I said, I'm coming December. Then he said, because I knew my chemo, everything was going to be done by November. I was going to go because the doctors would not let me go. So then he said, I won't be around. So now we had to negotiate. So I said, okay, what do you want me to do? He said, I want to see. I said, you won't be able to see me. He says, why? I said, because I had a little surgery, something was wrong with my foot. I lied. And I had to, and I can't walk good because of that little surgery. The doctor said I shouldn't get on a plane. So he said, Oh, so you've been fooling me. You're not coming on the so I say, Yeah, I say, but well, I know what you want. I say, let's talk about your burial. Let's talk about I'm writing, I'm sitting up in my sick bed, I'm taking note, everything he wants. I want this this prize. I want the world, the warriors to be, to dance. I want a dog club. I want the women singing, people dancing in the street. I want this and I want that. And I'm everything he said, I say, oh, you got it. I say, if I have to sell my house to bury you, I will bury you and I'll give you the biggest, grandest burial. He said, I don't want to go to this funeral home. I want to go to this funeral home. I I said, okay, that's where you go. I did everything. He was laughing. My daughter, he was laughing. And you know what? He died the next day. Mm. He, after we said goodbye, he blessed me on the phone. I was shocked. The next day I got a call. He had died. And I'm like, wait a minute. I talked to the man yesterday. He was laughing. He was happy. He didn't sound like he was dying and all he wanted was that 
and then he blessed me and he died. Yeah. So that's that's the poem, Fire and Rain. And yeah, that so that poem came out of that. It's really, really unfortunate that um, he died the next day after having satisfactory chat with you. So so unfortunate. Um uh, before we round up this part, uh, it's sad anyway. Uh, I, I want us to look at a poem titled Prayer Song for My Children in the book, which is also titled Prayer Song for My Children. What is the poem all about? I noticed that you use local words, local languages like Kaloko, Mami Wata, and others there. Um, uh, it seems like... Um, is cultural, uh, culturally structured in terms of the language and the style you use. Tell us, tell us through this poem. What is the poem about? Some of the words are, um, they're actually names of towns, like, like prayer song and borderline takes you through towns. It's, so that's the influence of traveling through the rural part of Liberia. But some of those words are actually words that are, are significantly grouped. So when and, and where in some of the poems are saying, you know, where you know where means great woman, great mother, and 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 the great mother, and the word Ie means grandmother, older woman, great woman, our mother of the town. Yes, uh, like the lines, uh, I'm becoming my mother, I'm becoming uh, fire and rain, I mean, like your, like your father in this context. I'm becoming Sibyl. Yeah, yeah, those words like that. So, <laughs> I'm becoming Sibyl. That means I'm becoming difficult. I'm becoming, you know, way up there. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I can't thank you enough. Our viewers have learned something. We have gained a lot uh, from this woman. And um, I believe that um, when we explore the other part of the globe, we'll still learn more. Keep watching CBA. This is Atlas.